been teaching people about identifying bolites and also how to tell safe bolites from bad bolites. Anyway, I just came across several here. Here's one that I just picked out of this sphagnum moss, and my dog Little Wisp is helping me. Um, got another one right here in the ground. This one's older, so I'm not going to draw upon this one. Here's a, a fresh one coming up. You can see on the top of this bolete here, it's been eaten away. Slugs love bolets, many insects, ex, insects love bolets. However, these are no loss. You can see the almost characteristic, really thick stem. Not all bolets have that. But what you really look for under a bolete, I don't know if my camera in the view, video uh, setting can pick this up. What you really look for to identify a bolete, we have a stem here, a stipe, that's a proper word. Excuse me, a bug was biting me. We have a cap here, or a pilus. Underneath here, we have, sorry, bugs again. <laughs> Underneath here we have, uh, it's like a sponge surface, a spongy surface. It's uh, not the gills one usually thinks of with a mushroom. Now, with boletes, boletes are edible ex unless they turn blue. I call it testing for the blue. So um, well, there's two things you watch for with boletes, red, yellow, or orange surfaces, um, pore surfaces under those caps. And if they are red, yellow, or blue, that's an alarm. And uh, personally, uh, you should avoid them, especially if they are red, yellow, or blue, and they are, are sorry, red, yellow, or orange, and they turn blue when pressure is applied. And this is one you must avoid. Now, I will eat caps that turn yellow or that that have red or yellow or orange pore surfaces if they don't turn blue, and that's the key thing. I will not eat any bolete period that turns blue. And I would especially avoid a bully with a red or yellow or orange pore surface under the cap that turns blue. Now I'm going to break off this cap entirely to demonstrate this best. I'm just going to set the camera down. So here's the pore surface, the cap, just the cap. Now and I'm going to give it a little pinch, you'll see it turn blue. Watch, you can see it literally turning blue within seconds after I pinch it. Now I'm going to take my knife and I'm going to slice that bully. So, I'm just going to slice this bully in half and I'm going to show you what happens when I do. Look under there. See how fast that's turning blue? This bolete has an orange pore surface that bruises blue and turns blue within seconds. You really should not eat that bolete. Absolutely not that one. Now, when you test for the blues, you should go, um, you should let those boletes, I let them go up to four hours. I will pinch and cut every bolete that I'll take. I'll usually just take a little slice off the edge of the cap and I'll pinch it beside that slice too. And if, uh, if that bolete turns blue within four hours, then I will not eat that bolete. Now, um, when bolete, as bolete's dry, the, uh, the cap surface, any areas along the surface that's, um, that's maybe wrinkled as it dries or if it's damaged and it dries, you might get a little bit of bluing. It's almost like um, scabbing over. It's really more black than blue. It can look a little blue. And uh, sometimes that confuses people because uh, that's not the true bluing. What we are looking for when we test for the blues is the actual bluing of the flesh or the pore surfaces in response to being exposed to air or crushed. So that's testing for the blues with bolites. I've been meaning to shoot this little vid for a while and I just happened to come across the right bolites for doing that. And I think I see a pair of nice large edible seps off to my left, so I'm going to go and harvest those now. I said I saw some nice uh, sep mushrooms. Uh, seps are just a general word for many species of really good edible boletes, and here they are. You can see I have quite a number of them, including this pretty large one here, that one there, all of these growing under this tree. So I'm going to harvest these lovely, stick them in my bag, and then move on. I'm heading out to a place where some currant bushes grow in the woods. and. Uh, and I'm um, going to harvest some currants today too. I suspect that most of them will be ripe by now. Well, bolites are a lovely, delectable mushroom. The trouble with them is, is that they are a favorite among uh, pests. 
insects and slugs. You can see that this mushroom has, this particular bullet mushroom has literally been cored by slugs. So um, it's just too eaten up for me to bother with. In fact, here's another one just devastated by by uh, slugs and mushrooms. These three here are the only ones out of that seven or eight that were still any good, but that's okay. I found a sack of half and a bull eats in the last couple days. So this is just a, a bonus because I wasn't even after mushrooms really today. So I've just come across uh, several more bull eats, another half dozen or so, and most of them were good. I think all but one was good, so uh, they are all in the bag now, and they're good sized bull eats, so the bag is filling out nicely. And it's all a bonus anyway, uh, because, like I said, I wasn't even planning on harvesting mushrooms. I always bring a bag with me, because you never know when you'll find mushrooms. And um, they were just a bonus along the way. Mushrooms, most of the ones that I eat are mycorrhizal with trees, so to look for these mushrooms, you look in the shrubbery, in the bush, and in the brush, always within trees. Uh, you don't want to get much past the, the line of the branches where the feeder roots would grow, and that's where you'll find many of the mushrooms. Now, some mushrooms I eat that don't grow among trees. Um, mostly, uh, sometimes I might get into agaricus mushrooms. If I'm absolutely certain they're agaricus, you must be exceedingly cautious with gilled mushrooms because uh, uh, a mistake with gilled mushrooms can be deadly. You can get into the non-gilled mushrooms pretty safely. There aren't any deadly non-gilled mushrooms. Anyway, the main reason I pulled out my camera here is because I have just come across a beaked hazelnut bush or tree, whichever you want to think of it. I think sometimes they can get to be 20 feet tall. They're usually close to 8 or 10 feet tall. So large shrub, small tree, whatever you want to think of it as. These are beaked hazelnuts. Hopefully the sun won't. I'm going to just come around with the camera and lift this leaf so that you can see the hazelnuts. That's a big hazelnut. These are very near ready to harvest. They are about as big as they're gonna get. There's a nice group of three or four there. there been, there's a nice pair right there. They're about as big as they are going to get. Um, they just are not quite ripe. I was at this tree about four or five days ago. All the beaked hazelnuts in an area come ripe at just about the same time. I know where a dozen large groves of beaked hazelnut trees are. And I watch them very closely at this time because they all come ripe at the same time. And within just two or three days of being ripe, the squirrels will clear them off the trees entirely. Last year we went out to go harvest. It rained, so we took a break of three or four days. Um, while while it rained, it rained nonstop for several days, and the day after we went out to go recover the nuts, and uh, they were gone. The squirrels had wiped them out. So this year, and from henceforth, I check them every week until they get close to ripe. And once they're close to ripe, I check them every other day. And the day they're ripe, then we make a big family day of it, and we go out and we fill two or three sacks with them. We we'll leave lots for the squirrels, but we will harvest three, well, probably closer to three or four grocery bags of them. And uh, my wife and daughter will use these to make. Uh, treats and desserts and such through the year. They're quite small, the big hazelnuts. I mean, these are big, the hazelnuts themselves, they're big, but um, it's, it's a little nut inside it. Actually, there's a shell inside here. It looks like an acorn, and inside of that is the nut, and the nut is no bigger than the fingernail of my little finger right there. Big hazelnuts require some attention. They are lined with a kind of fur, and the closer that they get to ripe, the harder that fur gets. It will eventually get to be um, like tiny little needles or, uh, and, and if you handle it, if you've ever stuck your hand in fiberglass insulation, if you ever tried handling fiberglass insulation without gloves, it's like that. You don't notice it at first. After a couple minutes, it'll start to itch. After a few more minutes, it will start to burn and you will regret it for a couple of hours. So when you harvest big hazelnuts, you must wear leather gloves. I'm going to pick one off of here just now and just, uh, just sample it, uh, cut it open with, uh, my knife here and, uh, see how close, how far along it is in terms of getting ripe. Um, typically, they're going to be getting ripe about the time that those outer husks are starting to brown. They're just starting to show brown, but I think they have a, a couple of weeks to go until these are ripe. I've been harvesting them for years. The big hazelnut has an, a smooth bark, white specks on the bark, thin, graceful branches. The leaves themselves are toothed, quite heavily toothed small teeth and large teeth, deep lobes in the leaf, and uh, they are largely oval with somewhat lanceolate points. 
And honestly, I don't remember what they look like when the leaves are younger. Sometimes leaves look um, smaller when they're younger. I just don't really start paying attention to them until around midsummer, <laughs> and I have them all memorized by heart anyway. So I've never paid attention to the shape of the small leaves. I, you know, when you, when you harvest, I've been harvesting for decades. I grew up foraging, and um, it was often how I got by on the uh, the farm where I grew up. We lived in an almost third world level of poverty, and foraging was a necessity. It really was a necessity for us. And when you harvest for so long, har or sorry, forage for so long. You get to a point where you can just look at something. Oh, that's a that's a beech nut tree, and you see another thing, and, and you don't even know how you do it. Oh, there's a, a service berry tree or a cherry. Of course, we didn't have beech nuts and service berries in Louisiana and the bayous where I grew up. We had um, we had wild pecans and passion fruits and such. Right over here, we have wild cherries, and they are just starting to come ripe. They have a ways to go yet, but. Uh, they're going to get there. So I'm going to continue heading on down this trail because I want to eventually get to my currants and harvest them as I have a great deal of work to do today around the farm before I'm done. So it's proving to be slow going getting out to my currants because uh, I've just come across several more service berries. This one has some berries on it. Right there. Another service berry bush there. Service berry bush back that way, you probably can't really tell one from the other since cameras tend to flatten the perspective on things. But these are service berries. Uh, the leaves are slightly toothed, largely oval, and then slightly lanceolate points, and uh, a brown, fairly smooth bark. In some ways, a lot like uh, the beet hazelnuts, except the beet hazelnut bark has the, the white dots on it, and the leaves are more heavily lobed, much more heavily lobed, and heavily toothed. Anyway, I'm going to eat a few of these berries and then move on along.